Welcome to Moon Day 2020 at the Frontiers of Flight Museum. I'm Dan Steelman, Vice President of Collections and Exhibits, and I'm standing in our new space flight gallery in front of our moon rock display the only moon rock on display in North Texas. Professor Chaz Hafey of Brookhaven College has participated in Moon Day from the very beginning. He's an expert on moon rocks and lunar soil, and he's prepared this presentation about the samples brought back by the Apollo astronauts and what we've learned from them. Hello, everyone. My name is Chaz Hafey. I work at Dallas College at Brookhaven. I'm the lab manager at for astrophysics at Brookhaven. My degree is in astrophysics, and this title of this program is called Real Moon Rocks. Uh, just let me explain my past a little bit. In the past, I uh, worked at different science and technology centers, one in Columbus, Ohio, then in Seattle, Washington, called the Science Place, and Richmond, Virginia, and then the Science Place right here in the Dallas area. That's my past, but the last 15 years I've been at Brookhaven College. So first off, let's talk about what a moon is. A moon is an object that orbits a planet. Sometimes they're called satellites. We have some artificial satellites that we put up and orbit around the Earth. Uh, but a moon is something that orbits a planet. Uh, right now shown is a, a moon from Jupiter. It's the moon Ganymede. Well, let me talk about a little bit about some names that we use on a regular basis. Uh, right now, if you're listening to this on Moon Day, Moon Day is actually on a Saturday. On a Saturday. So if you take a look, Saturday, what is it named after? It's named after one of the seven objects that you can see. with your naked eye in the nighttime sky that change its position compared to the stars. So Saturn's one of those. Moon day would really should be on a Monday because Monday is named after, of course, the moon. And of course, Sunday, that's a pretty obvious one, is named after the sun. Now from there on, the days of the week might not appear uh, to be quite what you'd think. What's Tuesday named after? It's Mars, isn't it? It's named after Mars. But if you look over here in the French and the Spanish, do you see Mars sitting in there in the name? Okay. How about on Wednesday? Ah, you see the name Mercury in there, don't you? Okay. What about Thursday? Thor's Day. The head god, Jupiter. There you go. Friday is, of course, Venus. So if you look at other languages, you might be able to recognize the days of the week. They're named after, again, the seven objects that are in orbit that you can see out there in outer space compared to the background stars, and they're moving. The moon's orbiting the Earth, but the others are orbiting something else. Now let's talk about the moon's shape and how it uh, can predict some things on the Earth. A long time ago, uh, the ancient people of Central Africa would use the tilt of the crescent moon to figure out when the wet season was going to be. So in January, the moon's not tilted very much, but it gets tilted more and more and more, and then it levels back out, and that's the peak of the wet season right there in the middle of the year. And then it gets tilted and tilted and tilted more till December, and then back to January, where it's not tilted as much. So the tilt of the crescent moon actually predicted, helped them understand the seasons that they had, the wet and dry seasons. That's interesting. Go forward in time to something called Stonehenge in 1550 BC when it was completed. It took a long time to, to be built. And why was it built? Well, that's a good question. It was used for various things over a period of time. And if you look, 
on this diagram of Stonehenge, you can see it predicts or shows you the sunset for the first day of winter, the first day of summer, sunrise and sunset points, but also moonrise and moonset points as well. Wow. Uh, I just got to watch a June, the end of June, when we had the first day of summer um, live video stream from Stonehenge showing you the sunrise over the Heelstone. Unfortunately, the sunrise over the Heelstone, that's the name of it, right here is the Heelstone, on the end of June, and this year it was cloudy, so we couldn't see the sun rising over the Heelstone. So going much further in time, we end up with Galileo Galilei. Okay, why do I have him up there? Well, he did not invent the telescope, but he is famous for using his telescope when writing down some of the things that he saw. And so he recorded what he saw on the telescope. That's why he's so famous. He saw the mountains and the valleys on the moon and found out that the moon was not a perfect sphere as had been thought about. All the things in the sky were thought to be perfect, but Galileo found out otherwise. He actually even found the heights of the moons based upon the shadow of the mountains that they cast on the moon's surface. So Galileo also saw something else. He saw moons around the planet Jupiter. So right here is Jupiter, and right beside Jupiter, he saw some moons. Just, just in a, another day or two later, the moons were rearranging themselves. And at some point, he could see four of them. If he looked over the course of just a few hours, he could see that they moved in just a few hours. And you could do the same thing. All you need is a pair of binoculars that you can hold steady, or a small telescope, and you see the moons of Jupiter, the big moons of Jupiter, Galileo, of uh, Galileo. They're called the Galilean moons, but uh, Callisto, Ganymede, Io, and Europa are the moons of Jupiter, the big moons that are called the Galilean moons. All right, let me talk about some of the basics. I don't usually read slides on PowerPoints, but I'll read this one to you. There's only natural satellite. It's the only moon we have. You might get some debates by other people saying there's these objects, we call them asteroids, that sort of go in and out of orbit around the Earth. I, I don't call them a moon. Most other astronomers won't call them moons either. It, our moon is the fifth largest satellite in the solar system, the fifth largest moon. The average distance from the moon to the Earth it's about 384,000 kilometers. The center of mass of the Earth, if you put the Earth and Moon on a stick and tried to balance it on your finger, well, it would balance inside the center of the Earth. So really, the Moon is orbiting the Earth. The Moon completes an orbit around the Earth about every 27.3 days. That's called its sidereal period. The phase of the Moon from one new moon to another new moon, or from one full moon to one full moon, is 29 and a half days. It has to do with the Earth orbiting the sun as well as the moon orbiting the Earth. That's why there's a difference between what we call the synodic period and the sidereal period. The moon's about 3,400 kilometers in diameter. The total surface of the entire moon is about as much as Russia, Canada, and the United States combined together. Now, here's a great fact. Uh, I think I should call up Jenny Craig or Weight Watchers about this. If you went to the moon, you'd be only about one-sixth the weight as you would be here on the surface of the Earth. So take your weight, divide it by six, and that's how much you would weigh. Now, a little fact that we'll see the backpacks on the astronauts that walked on the moon. Those backpacks were, wow, they were like 300 pounds because they had the oxygen and all sorts of other things, even even water for them while they were walking around on the moon. Uh, so there's electronics in there uh, with radios and all sorts of things. 300 pounds. How could they have 300 pounds on their back? Well, on the moon, how much would they weigh? Divide 300 by 6, and you'd come up with 50 pounds. Shoot, we have uh, different students on our campus that 
go around with 50 pound backpacks. I see them all the time. Okay, so when did we start exploring outer space? October 4th, 1957. Russians sent up Sputnik 1 and was up there for about 22 days. People all over the planet were able to go out, look up, and see this thing crossing the nighttime sky, this little bit of light. And then in the United States, a lot of people were scared. If the Russians could put up a satellite up there, couldn't they launch bombs over top of us? Oh, yes. So the space race was on at that point. Well, we sent up things, and they sent up things, and they were trying to not just go around the Earth, orbit the Earth, but they wanted to actually get to the moon, and so did we. So the space race was on to who could actually put things on the moon, but also put people on the moon and bring them back to the Earth. The United States had three different space programs for humans at first. Mercury program was just to see if we could get them up in outer space. The Gemini program, could we get them up in outer space, get them in orbit around the Earth, get more than one of them at the same time, and for long periods of time, a week or more, because a trip to the moon would take several days, about three days, then be there for a while and then come back. It would take another three days. So the Apollo program was all about trying to get to the moon. So we had the Mercury program, then the Gemini program, and the Apollo program was how we could get to the moon. That's our goal. That was their, def their, their finish line. Try to get to the moon and then come back. All right, here's the first three astronauts that actually went to the moon. Well, actually, we had other astronauts that went to the moon and orbited the moon. But two of these three were the ones that actually first walked on the moon. Which one walked to the moon? Why don't you look at the video? See if you can figure out which one. If you look at the name tags, you might be able to figure out what it says right there. That is Neil Armstrong, and that's that's the first person that actually walked on the moon. The second person right a few minutes later was Buzz Aldrin. You might be able to see his name right there, and that's him. Collins never went, uh, never walked on the moon. He was in orbit in the uh, command module. Right there's his name. And he stayed in orbit around the moon. One of the other two men went down on the surface of the moon and came back up to the command module, then they came back to the Earth. I like to show this because this is the device they use to get to the moon. It's a Saturn V rocket. I like this image because it shows the uh, lightning in a far background while it's sitting on the launch pad. Only the space capsule up here, the very top, the command module, an illusion or excursion module at the top, just underneath. The rest, the rest of this rocket is all how to get there, is fuel for the most part. It's a time lapse sequence. I'll show you a movie in a little bit uh, toward the end of the program that you can see the launch of the Saturn V rocket. Most powerful thing we've made. Well, Maybe there's some more powerful things we're making right now, but it's the most powerful thing, the most powerful machine we made at that time. Okay, this was actually taken by Apollo 8. Those were the first astronauts that actually went to the moon, orbited around the moon. They never landed on the moon, but they took pictures like this of the Earth rise over the moon. You can get this picture a wallpaper format from Lowe's and Home Depot. That would be kind of cool. The end of the hallway at the Ohio State University Astronomy Department has this wallpaper on the end of the hallway. Okay, so we have the command module right here. Of course, this is the rocket engine at the end. If you look straight down on the command module, it looks like this, this image in the lower left-hand corner. And this thing right here, 
with the lunar excursion module, and that'll dock on the end of this while it's orbiting around the moon. before it goes down to the surface. And when it comes back up, it'll redock again. There it is, the Lunar Excursion Module. If you look, some parts of it looks like it has aluminum foil. Well, that's all it is in some locations. It's just a thin piece of what looked like aluminum foil. Weren't they scared about birds running into the thing or bugs or something? No, there's no bugs. There's no birds. There's no atmosphere on the moon. So that's the reason why they weren't scared of having any problems with anything running into it. Okay, this is one of the best pictures of Neil Armstrong on the moon. Now, just to let you know, Neil Armstrong had on his chest the camera, and he took a lot of the pictures. So, this is not Neil Armstrong. That's actually Buzz Aldrin. But I said it was one of the best pictures of Neil Armstrong. Well, if you look in the reflection on the visor, right there, that's a picture of Neil Armstrong on the moon. <laughs> a lot of people think this is a picture of Neil Armstrong, but it is. But it's the little reflection. That's what Neil Armstrong is right there. I like this picture because it shows the American flag. Looks like it's flapping in the breeze. But didn't I tell you there's no atmosphere on the moon? Well, how does it look like it's flapping in a breeze? At the top of the flag, there's a metal pole like your shower pole uh, uh, that's holding up your shower curtain. And it's spring-loaded, just like your shower curtain pole. And it didn't extend out all the way. The, the spring got caught. And so it didn't straighten out the American flag, but it looks like it's flapping in the breeze. If you look at the pictures of the Apollo 11 astronauts, it's the same crinkly look every every time. So the future astronauts landing on the moon, they didn't want the spring-loaded bar at the top of the flag to extend out. They wanted it to look like it was flapping in the breeze. So they tried to purposefully make sure it didn't unload all the way and stretch out the American flag. Just a bit of trivia. Oh, and look here. You can see the backpack that they were carrying, that 300-pound backpack. All right, the footprints on the moon. How long are they going to last? Do you have any idea? Well, if you said forever, you're close. There is some erosion on the moon. No, it doesn't rain or hail. There's no wind. There is a kind of wind. It comes from the sun. The solar wind, it has little tiny particles that impact the moon all the time. And over time, it'll degrade the uh, footprints on the moon. Also, meteorites and even small micrometeorites will hit. And the footprints over time will go away. But it might take more than a million years. All right. It took them about three days to get back. They came back in a little capsule. You can see it underneath the parachutes right there, three parachutes. They landed in the ocean. If you look, the frogman were putting floats around it to make sure it didn't uh, sink. And then, uh, of course, the crane lifted the uh, Apollo 11 capsule on top of its deck. But they pulled out the astronauts into a helicopter and they brought them on board. Look at this. They've got these, well, they look like biohazard suits that we would use today. And that's why they were wearing them, because we didn't know if there were any germs on the moon. Would they bring them back with them? They were in quarantine for a, quite some time. Uh, you can see them here looking at, that might be the only window in it. I'm not sure. But down here at the top, of this picture, you can see it says Hornet plus three. Here on the USS Hornet plus three were the astronauts. President Nixon actually went there to the Hornet to say, welcome them back. Are you okay? Uh, the president's asking, uh, sure, we're okay. They were in quarantine along with their doctor for a while. Once they got out of quarantine, there were ticker tape parades. They even put a uh, image of 
wonder if an astronaut that is uh, pictured on the stand. Must be the same picture they had on Live Magazine. So, is that Neil Armstrong? Well, yeah, but it's Neil Armstrong right there on the reflection, but mainly this is Buzz Aldrin. Yep, there you go. Oh, 29 cents on a U.S. postage stamp. And what is it, $500 now? No, I, you know, it's only about 50 cents now. So, if we go back, I should have gone back on the slide, but I didn't. Uh, I don't have the ability to do that right now. But if I go back in the slide, look at some of the pictures that were taken on the moon. All the shadows are very long because it was just at sunrise when they went. Why? Because it was cooler then. They didn't want to be there when it was hot. The heat of the day on the moon would be about 250 degrees. The cool of the night at nighttime would be about minus 250 degrees. So they didn't want to go either of those times, so they went right at sunrise. So if you look right here, this dark area here is called the Sea of Tranquility. Galileo thought all of these dark areas were oceans. So he named them Maria. So they all have names uh, with interesting things, the Sea of Crises, the Sea of Tranquility, and all sorts of other different seas. Uh, you can see the list of the names of the seas, the oceans uh, up there. The Sea of Serenity would be a good place to go right now. All right, and 1969 dollars, that's when we landed on the moon. That would be July of 1969. That's why we have Moon Day in July, of, uh, Saturday closest to the landing date. It would have cost 25.4 billion, well, it did cost 25.4 billion dollars in 1969 dollars for the entire, the entire program, not just to get that one Apollo 11 up there, but to get all of them up there. Today's dollars, $185 billion. We've spent a lot more on a lot of other things than that in today's dollars. What did we get back from it? A lot of high technology. Uh, the wristwatch that I have on right now, let me see if I can get into the, has a lot of technology in it. It's almost as powerful as the uh, computer on board the LAM to land on the moon. Now, how do we explain the existence of the moon? Where did it come from? Did the uh, stork bring it, bring it by? Mm, no, nope, not the stork. Well, let's take a look at some images that I've got sitting here. When I was uh, in college, one of the explanations was it just flew out of the Earth, and the Pacific Ocean could have been one of the explanations. Uh, another explanation was it formed at the same time as the Earth formed, and uh, because the Earth was bigger, it started orbiting the Earth. Those were two theories when I was in college that we talked about. We didn't talk about this theory that we have nowadays. It looks like an object about the size of the planet Mars ran into the Earth, had a glancing blow. So if we take a look at this picture, there's an object right here running into the Earth, hitting it at a glancing blow. It goes away, but it has a lot of debris that starts forming around the Earth. So here's the Earth, and here's the cloud of debris, which forms the moon. So the moon gathers all these different, it's called accretion, gathers all these materials together. And when it does, some of it gets hot inside the moon, and some of that comes out in the form of lava flows on the moon, those create the dark areas on the moon, the maria. And that's how the moon formed. That's our current best description, best theory on how it all formed. I like this image because it has a time lapse over a month period of time showing you that the moon actually gets bigger and smaller over a period of time because it doesn't orbit in a circle around the Earth orbits in what we call an ellipse. So there are times when the moon gets closer and further away, but also changes its appearance. We call it the phase of the moon. And how do we get the phase of the moon? Well, let's go over a couple of slides and see if we can figure that out. If you stood in one place and had the light of the sun coming in at you this direction, 
Well, she had a styrofoam ball in her hands and you went around in a counterclockwise circle. That's the direction of the orbit of the moon goes this is in a counterclockwise circle. Here's how I remember it. You take your right hand, stick up your right hand. There it is on my right hand side. Uh, yeah, okay. And you curl your fingers. That's the direction of counterclockwise. That's the right hand rule of the universe. That's how the moon rotates on its axis. That's how the moon goes around the earth. That's how the earth goes around the sun. We call it orbiting. That's the direction that the uh, all the planets go around the sun. So it's called the right hand rule of the universe. So if the moon goes around the earth in a counterclockwise direction, it goes around like this, around this direction. If the moon is right between you and the sun, well, the lit up part of the moon, it's half of it, but you don't see it because it's facing away from you. So this is called a new moon. You don't see it at all. There's a new moon. If you go one eighth of a turn, a little bit off to your turn off to your left, you'll see a the moon lit up a little bit. This is called a crescent moon. And because it's getting bigger every night, we call it a waxing crescent. Go another eighth of a turn. We're now one quarter of the way around in the moon's orbit. Sometimes we get off the first quarter because it's the first quarter of the moon's orbit. There's no dollars involved. Just, oh, yeah, quarters. Okay. Go another eighth of a turn and we have this called a waxing gibbous. It's more than halfway lit up. The face is facing toward us. Now, gibbous means a hump. Go another eighth of a turn. We're now completely facing away from the sun. The moon is on the opposite side of the sun. If we're using our little styrofoam ball and going around in a circle. And it's completely lit up from our vantage point. Now, how much of the Earth can see a full moon? Well, half of it, because half of it is facing the full moon. Go another eighth of the turn, we have something called a, another gibbous moon, but this time it's lit up on the left-hand side, and waning means it's getting smaller from one night to the next. Another eighth of the turn, we're now three quarters of the way around in the moon's orbit, so we call this the third quarter, or sometimes the last quarter. Uh, phase of the moon. And it's lit up on the left hand side as well. Another eighth of a turn, we'll see another crescent moon, but this time it's getting smaller from one night to the next, so we call it a waning crescent. So, and then another eighth of a turn gets us back to the new moon once again. It takes about 29 and a half days to go from new moon back to new moon again. So, how long is that? 29 and a half days? It's a moon. Oh, yeah, we call it a month, but it really should be called a moon. So once again, this is the phases of the moon, the 29 and a half day cycle of the moon. From new moon until back to new moon. We call this the lunar cycle. And we start the new part of the moon. That's the beginning of the lunar cycle. Now, the moon has the same face facing toward us all the time. It's called synchronous rotation. So what if you put the Earth in the center of a circle and you go around the circle, but you always face the Earth? Well, that's what the moon is doing. So the moon actually rotates once on its axis for every time it goes around the Earth. So that's why we have the same side visible from the Earth. We didn't know what the backside of the moon was until we had that first spacecraft go around the backside of the moon, take pictures, and beam it back to the Earth. Now, what causes eclipses? Well, it has to do with the Earth, the Sun, and the Moon. If we look right here, we've got the sunlight going to the Earth. Okay. And if the Moon travels into the shadow of the Earth back here, then light from the Sun doesn't get to the Moon. And we have an eclipse of the Moon. There's two parts to the shadow of the Earth, the umbra and the penumbra. And if the moon goes into the umbra, the dark part of the, uh, the Earth's shadow, then we don't see very much light hitting the moon. Only a little bit of light goes around the Earth's atmosphere 
around the edges of the atmosphere and gets to the moon. So the moon looks like a reddish color or an orange color. If the moon goes in the lighter part of the Earth's shadow, uh, then that's called a penumbral eclipse. And it's hard to tell with the moon dimming down. If you're watching this video in July of 2020, we just had a penumbral lunar eclipse just a couple of weeks ago. Now, what about an eclipse of the sun? If the moon is out here, well, actually it would be probably out here, and it blocks the light coming from the sun, we have an eclipse of the sun. If the moon is far enough away from the earth and it only blocks part of the sun as viewed from the earth, we call it a partial solar eclipse. If it just barely covers up uh, most of the sun, but not a little circle of the sun, we call it an annular eclipse. But if the moon is close enough to the Earth, it blocks out all the Earth, it's a total solar eclipse. We have the next total solar eclipse in the United States in the year 2024 on April the 8th. So this is what a partial eclipse of the sun would look like if you're on the Earth. And here's the map in 2024, April the 8th, and it goes right through Texas. So it would be a good time to go take a look at it. I'm going to take time off of work so I can take a look at that total solar eclipse. I've only seen one. That was in the year 2017. I was up in Idaho, and it was a lot of fun doing that. Now, gravity of the moon actually causes the tides. The moon pulls harder on the water that's on the side next to the moon, right here. So it makes a bulge. It pulls on the earth, and it pulls the earth a little bit. It pulls on the other side of the earth, the water, a lot less. So there's actually a bulge of water on the side that the moon is on and also on the side opposite the moon. These are high tides that are on the Earth. We don't talk about them much in North Texas because we don't have a lot of water here. But down in Houston, we have high tides. Now the sun also pulls on the water and has a bulge of water as well. It's indicated on this diagram as yellow. It's not yellow water. And the purple uh, is not a purple water situation with the moon. But in this diagram, we wanted to show you the lunar and solar tides. When the moon and the sun are pulling in the same direction or in opposite directions, we have something called spring tides, where we have the highest high tides and the lowest low tides. When the moon and the sun are pulling in 90 degrees of each other, we have something called spring tides. It's the lowest of the high tides and the less, uh, lesser of the low tides as well. Okay, let's be, we'll get back to Apollo. There were six Apollo landings on the moon. So there were two astronauts each time that landed on the moon. That would be Apollo 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Why did I leave out 13? Well, they went to the moon, they went around the moon, they didn't land on the moon because there was a problem. If you haven't seen the movie Apollo 13, why don't you go rent it or borrow it or take a look at it because it's a really good movie. This is the launch of Apollo 16 in 1972 is pictured here. So each time three astronauts went to the moon, but only two of those walked on the surface of the moon, the other one stayed in the command module. The last couple of missions, 15, 16, and 17, the last three missions, they actually took a rover so they could drive around much further to collect different rock samples. And on the very last mission was the only scientist that went up on the moon, Harrison Schmidt, and he was a geologist. He was looking for particular things on the moon. So geology is the study of the Earth's solids and processes by which they change. What's the study of the moon solids and processes by which they change? Do we call it moonology or moonology? No, 
Selenology is what it really is called. Selenology. What's the difference between moon rocks and earth rocks? Well, they're very similar to each other. Moon rocks are older because on the earth, we have things that erode the rocks away and cause them to not look or be like they were when they first formed on the earth a long time ago, when the earth was formed. Um, on the moon, there's no water, there's no air to erode the rocks. So they're older. Most of the rocks on the moon are much older. And the moon rocks don't have any water in them. For the most part, they don't have. Now, we haven't been uh, taking samples at the north and south pole of the moon. We believe there are um, areas of frozen water and the deep shadows of those craters on the north and south pole of the moon where the sun never actually shines inside those craters. So maybe some of those rocks do have some water, but we don't know that yet. All right, there was a new mineral first discovered on the moon when the Apollo astronauts brought back about 800 pounds of rocks over the course of the six missions on the moon. So what was this mineral named after? And who found it? Well, it was named after the Apollo 11 astronauts because they brought it back. Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins. So arm all co light. Put them all together, that's what you have. We found actually a total of two other minerals that were found. Tranquilite from the Sea of Tranquility, right? Pyroxyferrite. Those were things that we'd never found on the Earth, but since that time we've found samples of all those minerals on the Earth that we first found on the Moon. So there's really not much difference between the Earth and the Moon as far as minerals that we know. But when we go back, we might find some new things on the Moon that are not on the Earth. All right, let me talk about the Moon rocks that I would normally have to show to you during a Moon Day. The Moon rocks, that I get to show in a disc, we'll sh show you the picture of that in just a minute, came from Apollo 15, 16, and 17. They brought back the most rocks because they had the lunar lander where they could go explore lots of different places and uh, they could bring back heavier loads of rocks with them. All right, this is a picture of the disc that I had at Moon Day in 2019. There were 200 of these lunar sample disks that were created, and they were created so that teachers could borrow them and let students see them. They're encased in lucite. Uh, they're about, oh, I think an inch thick of lucite, and the disk is only a, a few inches in diameter. So these are small little samples. There's three uh, soil samples and three rocks. And orthocyte, breccia, and basalt are the the rocks and orange soil, I'll talk about in a minute, highland soil and marae soil. Uh, marae soil is the dark areas of the moon, what look like oceans. And if you look, the highlands is the light areas. Those are the higher parts of the moon. And it still looks like a dark gray soil. And the orange soil, again, I'll get back to that in a minute. Okay, so the moon is actually a very dark gray. And when you have the sunlight shining on it, it looks bright. I mean, isn't there a song about a silvery moon in the sky? Well, yeah, but if you take a look at a gray car at midday out in the parking lot, it looks bright It's because of the sunlight is so bright. So the moon shines because of the sun reflecting off of its surface. And it's actually a dark gray in color. Now, why is this orange soil important? Oh, I should circle around it in orange, shouldn't I? Okay, so it's circled around in orange now. On the last Apollo mission, this was found by the Apollo 17 astronauts. Our geologist, Schmidt, he actually was looking for this. If there's a volcano and it erupts, it produces some little particles, little nodules that form into little round pieces of glass. 
that are yellow and orange and red combined together, they look orange. And if you look at this sample of orange soil underneath a microscope, you'll see the little beads of glass. That's an indication that there were, guess what? Volcanoes on the moon, not all the craters were formed by things hitting the moon, by meteorites hitting the moon, but there were volcanoes on the moon. So we had the first proof of volcanoes on the moon. I want to uh, seconds, let you take a look at this channel. video for 12, the next few minutes. 11, 10, Armstrong is on the moon. Yeah, Neil Armstrong, 38-year-old American, standing on the surface of the moon on this July 20th, 1969. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I really wanted you to see that video sequence. It's one that NASA put together several years ago for the 50th anniversary of the Apollo landing on the moon. So those are the moon rocks that I would normally get to show you in person where you come up and take a picture of them. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. At the end, my name is Chaz Hafey. I work at uh, Dallas College at Brookhaven campus. And I hope you enjoy this virtual moon day.